Present. Take a minute to welcome everyone who's here with us this evening uh, from our distinguished member of the media, uh, our representatives from our local school, and our citizens and city staff. Thank you for being here. You are all an important part of our decision making process tonight, so we thank you for participating in our meeting. We'll now turn to the next item on our agenda, which is <coughs> additions and amendments to the agenda. Paul is custodian of the agenda. I'll turn it over to you for possible suggestions and changes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have one, uh, one suggestion for change, and that is to take the apology letter uh, off the agenda as a item to be read in discussions with Mr. Pritchard. That would not be read tonight. It would just merely be put in the file, uh, his personnel file, with your signature. Okay, I'll now open it up to any members of the council who'd like to suggest changes or amendments to the agenda. Okay, seeing none, uh, we will uh, remove the apology letter to Jeff Pritcher from the agenda. So we will no longer have a 5E. And now we'll move to our consent agenda, which includes the approval of the minutes of February 27th, 2012 council meeting, approval of the minutes of February 29th special city council meeting, approval of the minutes of February 11th, 2012 special council meeting, and ratification of the bills in the amount of $91,084.79. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Motion by Jeff Elfrich. Second. Second by Tom Cramblett. Any discussion, comment, or question? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the passage of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. We'll now turn to our action items. We'll bring to the floor the oath of office for counseling. Kathy? Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Brad, and welcome. We'll now bring to the floor uh, action item B, the second reading and adoption of Ordinance 415 regulating and controlling operation of the city's water utility system and provision of service to its customers. Paul, did you have a report? Yes, for that? honorable mayor, members of city council. This is the second reading and adoption of uh, the ordinance. <coughs> Uh, number 415, this replaces the Ordinance 255 that was inadvertently rescinded uh, by previous council action. So uh, there are a few typos in there, and that's because we merely took the previous ordinance and brought that forward. So we can make those changes if council so desires. Okay, Lori, you signed up for new business. I didn't have you down for one particular item. Did, was this one of your? No, it was just for the um, new job size class that took place this morning here. Okay, so we'll bring that up at okay. under six. Okay, thank you. So we did not have anyone uh, sign up for discussion on this this item. Uh, we have had a motion and a second at a previous meeting. Is there council discussion? Questions, comments? I don't have any, but if there's a few typos, wouldn't it be nice to clear those out now? Or sure. Yeah. So that they're fixed. 
fixed and adopted has, has changed or whatever? Have we identified those, Paul? Do you know which, where they are? Yeah. I've identified a couple of them, but I don't know if there are further. There's uh, two of them on the first page uh, under uh, number one, section 2.010 on rates. Uh, the second line, it should be there there too shall be set from time to time, not from time to time. Your Honor, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. You don't have to make those kinds of changes in order to adopt the ordinance. Those kinds of changes can be made, made afterwards. So if you, if you prefer to just have those um, um, communicated directly to Kathy, they can, that those can be fixed afterwards. Substantive changes I would definitely recommend that you do now, but if there are only edits like that, you don't need to go through as a council and approve them. Uh, has anyone identified substantive changes that need to be made? Okay. Other questions or comments? Thank you. So we've read this by title. Um, we've had a motion and a second at a previous meeting. Um, we will now uh, proceed to a vote. All those in favor of adoption of this ordinance, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Okay, we will now bring to the floor action item C, approving the creation of a public safety, uh, should say public safety um, council subcommittee. Paul, did you have a report for us on that? Yes, I did. Uh, Mayor and members of the city council in November uh, included in the final report that I gave you regarding the rebuilding of the emergency services department, there were a series of recommendations in that document. One of them was for the council to create a subcommittee on public safety. Uh, so what you, this is carrying that concept forward. You have a proposed job description for the city council subcommittee on public safety. Uh, we're recommending that you, by motion, approve and authorize the creation of that council subcommittee. I've included a sample motion uh, in the staff report for you, and will be able and willing to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, we also didn't have anyone um, sign up from the audience to speak to that, so uh, we'll move now to a council motion and second. motion that we adopt a job description, create a city council subcommittee on public safety, and appointing certain members of the city council to membership. Okay, motion's been made by Tom Cramlin. Is there a second? Second. Second by Randy Holmstrom. Any question, comment, or discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions, motion carries. And uh, for the record, I'll be ready to make those appointments at our next regular council meeting. So if council members are interested in those positions, please make sure you let me know. Okay. We'll turn now to um, our last action item, authorization of a new position in the Public Works Department. Paul, did you have a report for us on that? Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, this is item number 5D. Uh, and it, it's a staff report with the three uh, approved job descriptions that I included in the packet for your information, along with a fiscal analysis of the uh, various portions of the city budget that would fund this position. As you are aware, at, uh, Council had entered into a contract for a uh, part-time contract with, uh, uh, with Dave to be your public works director. And the idea evolved over time that he would be here so many hours a month, and now he's here about a day and a half a month. 
And the concept was that the savings from using a part-time contract public works director would allow the city to uh, receive the certifications required to operate water and sewer facilities, which don't exist in the city anywhere else. And so uh, by creating that savings, the thought was that you would be able to add one more worker to the public works crew, and that's what we're asking you to authorize us to do tonight. So the recommendation is that you authorize uh, the position of the utility worker one at $13.54 per hour plus benefits and directing us to fill that new position in accordance with existing city hiring procedures means that we would advertise, uh, interview, and then select uh, the most qualified, appropriate staff person for that. <coughs> We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, we also did not have anyone sign up to speak to this item. So the next step is a council, council motion and second. Mark, motion. I move to create the position of utility maintenance worker one at $13.54 per hour plus benefits and directing the ICA to fill the new position in accordance with existing city hiring policies. Okay, motion's been made by Mark Storm. Is there a second? Second. Second by Brad Lorang. Council question, comment, or discussion? Tom. So, I know we had um, we had discussion on the, on the supervisor part of it, um, whether we wanted to contract out to that as well. Uh, I don't know how far we went on, how far we went on that discussion. I see a little bit that's been addressed, that has been addressed in here, where it might be, um, with this person coming in, is that the first time with this person coming in, that the, the contract person will work less hours on their, on their contract? Yeah, and the plan is, and well, I'll be back in front of council at the next meeting or the following meeting at the latest. What we're discussing with Dave is what is the, the logical phase out for his work here in Cascade Locks. And as soon as we know what the timing will be to take the three remaining employees and get them trained so they have the certifications, that's the critical piece for us right now. If it takes as much as 18 months to do that, then you want to keep Dave here so that those certifications are available to the city. We don't know yet when all the training programs will be held and how we're going to schedule the three workers so that you have that certification in-house. But that's the plan right now, Tom. So along with that is, so right now we have a contract superintendent. That's we're correct. not looking at them. Um, are we looking at the, one of these three employees that are supposed to become the superintendent, or are, are we looking at keeping the superintendent but on, but on a um, less hours? Yeah. Uh, our discussion is that Dave Griffin, your current part time superintendent, your contract superintendent, would eventually, over 18 months, no longer be here. What you do with the rest of the organization, whether or not somebody stays at a supervisory level or moves up, that, that is yet to be worked out. And I, I see that happening in the budgetary process, along with my report to you about where you go in public works over the long term. Okay. Uh, with the uh, budget issues that we're, that we're talking about and the shortfalls we face, are we able to utilize the current contract employee, Dave, to help develop and mentor one of the three or all three of them to get them to the point where they're able to be part of, get certified, because I understand it's a, a long process and it takes a lot of hard work to get there and studying, but would that affect his hours by mentoring the employees to, to get the certifications? Is that going to be? Yeah, Dave and I have talked about that and we don't see that extending his hours. We see that being a part of his hourly commitment when he is here. Part of what he does and, and what you need to have done is somebody to <coughs> develop and mentor your public works employees. And, and he's more than happy to do that. Okay. 
So just make sure that's within our contract. I'm not going to expend yes. more monies for that. Okay. Yeah, there would be no additional cost to the city. Is that due, Tom? Yeah, uh, a question on the, on the finances. Are we taking them because they, st they stepped up and took on more responsibilities? Are you telling worker one to a field supervisor? And uh, are you telling worker one? Utility maintenance too. So we, uh, because of the situation, we only bump, like we bump their salary down. <coughs> so that's going to, that will continue to that, that continue to stay. So we'll be budgeting for that, for those salaries uh, for where they're at right now. Too. That's the plan right now. As soon as we know what the transition plan is, how we're going to phase Dave out, what I think council and the budget process are going to have to deal with that issue. Apparently, at the time that Dave was brought in as the contract uh, and not here full time, the decision was made to increase the salary of the people in public works to accommodate for that that workload. Whether that continues is a, that's a policy decision for you folks. I think along those same lines, when we've had this discussion before, we talked about how. If you're going to bump someone up in salary, uh, you got to be careful because you don't want to be the kind of employer that one year bumps them up in salary, but then the next year through the budget process or whatever policy decisions are being made, you then bump them back down. You know, if you had a, a field supervisor position, but then you, you decided at some point in the future, but we don't want that. We want a superintendent position, and then, and then that position goes back to um, utility worker one or two. You know, you just got to be careful about how you how you proceed. But we've we've had those discussions as well, which I think is part of this equation. Right. You do have to be real careful about the, you know, what kind of employer are we that we have someone at a higher rate and we bump them back down. You know, that's not that's not a good way to uh, to attract new quality employees. That's potential is there for that because it is. If you bring in a super superintendent. It probably is, but I think it's important to bring it up now as part of this discussion. If our intent is uh, to proceed with with the, the training and mentoring that Jeff's talking about, you got to be, you know, th then then that's the trajectory we're looking at. We're not looking at we're looking at training someone from within the organization to take on the, the responsibilities and phasing out that that superintendent. That's that's the it appears that that's the trajectory you're you're recommending. That that's the direction that we're going. Yes, Randy. But the contracted public works superintendent right now, what, how many hours did you say he was working? Because I didn't, I didn't catch that. I thought, I thought I heard a day and a half a month, but that's what I heard too. I, I think that's correct. I know, I know it's in the report somewhere. half day a week for approximately four hours. Does that come out to? It's out to two days. Two days a month. Yeah. Couple it's, days. it's roughly a day and a half to two, to two days a week. A week or a month? It's, it's, it's a week. Because he's here each week. OK. Jeff? I think to address Tom's concern for future policy issues, the city should look at having an acting role or a temporary that title of that where you would have that increase in pay where you would be able to compensate them for the extra workload that they're doing and by title of acting but then when the position's filled you don't end up with what Tom has suggested or what could happen or the possible as an organization you bump them back down after you give them a salary increase. I think that's a, that should be the policy of the city to do that because it's fair for the employee they know where they stand and if they hire someone from out the, on the outside they're not uh, anticipating that income that potential that they got the raise for. I think that's only fair and that keeps it very transparent for the, for the city staff to look at. Right, and you'll find yourself in the, in the other part of that equation, which is that as uh, in most cities, when public works employees achieve certifications and move through the certification process, 
they're usually uh, rewarded with an increase in pay. Okay, further comment, question, or discussion? Okay. Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions? Motion carries. Okay, that'll do it for our, our action items. Turn now to uh, the parents of interested citizens to share a variety of perspectives. We have a number of people who have signed up. Uh, Gary and Larry, um, you signed up for the, the item that we that we decided not to do. Did you want to, to stay on for this item, or do you still want to speak? Yeah, so we'll just roll you into this one. Okay. So first up is uh, Don Haight to talk about 911 FEMA. Don? Oh, hey, Don, before you start, I just noticed, Paul, that uh, it looks like our, our computer is about to restart. I don't know if that's what you want or not. But if you, if you, it is? It's not working. Okay. Sorry about that, Don. Go ahead. Thank you, Don Haight, City of Cascade Walks. <coughs> on, on February 27th of the last meeting, <coughs> I presented the following report and information to the mayor and council. And uh, I may not have made myself clear. So I'd like to read it if I may. I understand that Hood River County has not paid their $38,400 matching funds to the City of Cascade Locks for the FEMA grant, but it's long overdue. And I said I'd like to suggest that uh, the Council invite someone from Hood River to address the City Council and explain just why they have refused to pay their portion of this project. It is very obvious that Hood River 911 Department is not satisfied with the outcome of this project. I would also like to know why the city is going to have to spend twenty dollars to $30,000 to remove and install another tower for this project. How is this mistake made? Who is responsible? And who will pay the bill? I did not ask if the FEMA system was working or how it was working. I didn't even mention that. that. That's not my concern in my report. The city auditor presented his report during this, this last meeting. He said there were no reports available regarding this project. How can a $500,000 project be audited if there's no information available? Or reports how can the city council accept an audit report when the auditor makes a statement that there's no information available regarding the project? I didn't hear one question asked about that. I'd like to know why information was not provided to the auditor. There's a lot of information available. I'd like to read just five items that I consider very important to this project and I assume would affect the auditor's opinion regarding the FEMA project. Is this going to play music? The first one I'd like to read is paragraph 2.3 of the FEMA Intergovernmental Agreement. If anyone doesn't understand me, please interrupt me. I'll try to make it a little clearer. The project and commitment of agencies matching funds are contingent upon the party's mutual acceptance of the results of an emergency communications system study prepared by a qualified consultant in response to a request for a proposal to be prepared and issued by the City of Cascade Locks in mutual agreement of how future upgrades maintenance, replacement costs, to identify the funding and paid by all parties. 
In other words, no one was supposed to pay their matching funds until this was finished. This is just one thing. The second item I have is item six. Records, maintenance, cascade locks as the, as the pass-through agency shall maintain accurate cost accounting records and cash balances under this IGA. Cascade locks shall use and maintain accounting policies, practices, and procedures which are consistent with generally accepted accounting principles in accordance with and compliance with all of applicable laws. Paragraph 12.24. Keep good records of expenditure made pursuant to this contract. None of those, none of those have been done. That I can find copies. If anybody, anyone can, that's that's news to me. I suggest the council reads letters dated April 7, 2010, from the previous attorney that was serving the city during the, the writing up of this contract. This, this was to, to Bernard Seeger. I also suggest you read the letter from Bernard Seeger and Jeff Pritchard dated March 22, 2010, to the mayor and city council. Please note. Mr. Seeger and Mr. Pritchard gave their recommendations before they received the lawyer's legal recommendations regarding the FEMA project and the fact that, ultimately, if the grant conditions are not met by Cascade Locks, responsibility will, be, will rest with the city. Please explain to the citizens of Cascade Locks just who is responsible for not fulfilling the obligations of this FEMA grant. And who will be paying the bill to, to correct these very obvious and expensive mistakes? As some of you on the present council may recall, I've been trying for several months to locate at least one report from this project. One report. Where are these documents? As of today at 4.30, Hood River has not paid their, their money. And they're not going to. I would like to know, when are we going to get to the bottom of this? I haven't heard anyone that's responsible. I know in the private business, if someone makes a mistake, it's going to cost somebody up to $90,000. Someone made a mistake. Thank you, Don. I'm not done yet. Well, the, the five minutes has come up. Okay, I'll, can I hand out some? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. something about, uh, I think you should address the council yeah, staff. Okay. I mean, May I? I'll, I'll hand it to him. I'll take it. I just don't want a lecture. That's okay. Hey, hey, I, I let, hey let's pass out the stuff. We want to get Gary up here. Do I still have the floor? Uh, your five minutes is up. Yeah. If you wanted to pass out some stuff, you can. Gary's up. Gary Munkoff, president of Cascade Locks. Um, I'm here to object to the letter that was written in the of apology to Jeff Pritchard. I don't think the city should be disseminating any communications that contain inaccurate or misleading statements. And this letter certainly does. It talks about 
excellent training of our volunteers. Uh, the fire department is a paramilitary organization. It has a clearly defined chain of command with captains and lieutenants. One of the first things that any paramilitary organization learns to do is to regroup if anything should happen to any one of its members. This did not happen in the case of our organization. It totally fell apart. They were unable to respond to emergencies. And somebody's responsible for that. And we had a fire chief. He was responsible for it. You cannot say he provided excellent training for our volunteers. He may have provided excellent training in some areas, but he failed to provide full training for those people. And our organization fell completely apart. So that, I believe that should be stricken from that letter. Second, it says that he professionally managed his budget. Now well, that's odd because the, the auditor says otherwise. A few years ago, we had a beginning balance of several hundred thousand dollars. That was dwindled away to where we finally ended up in the red in his department. That's hardly professional management. That item should be stricken from that letter. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, next up is Larry, talking about the same item. Larry Crowley, resident of Cascade Locks also. Um, I feel the same about your letter. Um, I feel that was not only your fire chief problem, but also a boy that the mayor who's in here and two people appointed here was on that, was on that council. And so is the administrator that was on that during that time. And I really believe that you did not control your fire chief. Yes, he's partly blamed, but so are you for not doing the job as a council person. That last council tried to make the corrections and we saw what happened to them. Also, uh, a member of the community, if you remember right, as, as this mess came through, a member of the community came and said, I'll build the fire hall cheap, cheaper and you guys would not listen to him. Other people came and asked for things you wouldn't listen to him. And the fire chief just went on and built his fire hall at a price of $450,000 over the cost. So what you do? Ask council. We'll take care of it. We'll just make it a $450,000 hold, and we'll borrow from the, the uh, life fund. Again, as we know, as Gary said, we're still in, in a hole. Don Pate came back up as the 911 brand. I am on the River County Budget Committee. And I was first here about the grant when I was on the committee. And in our packet, we get a piece of paper that talks about it. And things kind of question when you get worried about things, how things go and how they should go. And when you get a thing such as capital outlay, Cascalox FEMA grant has still not been settled and it's currently being handled by Hoogerberg and the Cascade Locks Legal Department. There's something wrong there then. And I am still on, on the budget committee. I stopped by again today to see if it's been paid, and it hasn't been paid. The problem is the idea of the 911 is not only the whole package coming down, but the, like they said, the power, the permits, um, things that just, just wasn't put together well. I don't believe, I see three of you people on that council floor, my fact, my brother, that you were even brought to front of you, this FEMA grant, prior to it moving. And I think it just went down the road and here we are. Um, also, 
as the chief, there were some words in there that I questioned too, as the professionalism. Um, I don't know if you remember right, but there was a fire in a fireman, uh, renters had called, and the, the renters called the owners. The owners came and actually doused the fire. The fire chief came in with the idea to come in, rather than sit and be professionally and talk about what, what, what you do, what can I do, you wanted to cut a hole in the house, you wanted the, the wife handcuffed. It wasn't real professional, folks. It, that, that really questioned me when you put those kind of words in your, in your sentence. And the newspaper. This is how I heard the apology. Apology through the newspaper. Apology should have been brought by Mr. Mayor or by you, not by the newspaper. When he resigned, he founded a newspaper. That's how I learned about it. You remember Castellos in the newspaper. When a newspaper reporter comes to a council meeting and listens to you, you would think that he would be in an invest investigative mode, asking questions on both sides. I don't feel that's going to happen anymore. Hey, Larry, if you, can, know, if you can address the council, I think that's I, the appropriate thing to do. I do, and I'm telling you what I think. You guys are part of this, and it's been going through here. It's been like a scam to me. And I would, would hope that if you guys are going to invite a newspaper person to come and listen and talk at discussions that both views be put in that paper, and this has to happen. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. You're welcome. And next is Lori to talk about. She left. Okay. So that's it for our um, parents of citizens on a variety of perspectives. And we'll move now to our reports <coughs> and presentations. Um, the first one from Cascade Locks School Principal Kim Vogel. Would you like a break while you set that up? Or? Yeah. Okay. How about if we take a five minute break and we'll come back to that report? Again, we are clad, Casket Locks Against Drugs, and many of you have probably seen this as you drive into town. And we wanted our students to have ownership in this program and grant writing, and so we held a contest to come up with a name and a logo, and two of our students of the group came up with it. And uh, so it's Casket Locks Against Drugs, <coughs> Stay Active, Stay Healthy, and I always reverse those. <laughs> it's a drug prevention coalition that has, that reformed last spring to see what we could do to unite our community behind a common mission to reduce youth drug use and increase the health and safety of our community. I'm just going to recap on what Ms. Vogel said. We say reform because there was a drug prevention coalition, CLIC, 
that worked towards the same goal from 1991 through 2004 with funding from the Drug-Free Community Support Program. Our coalition is eligible to apply for five years of funding from this federal program, and it is $125,000 per year. Coalition is eligible to apply, whereas the City of Casky Locks was a previous fiscal agent from Flick. To be eligible for another five years of funding, we needed to have a different fiscal agent. Hood River County School District has agreed to serve in this capacity. CLAD has completed a community assessment of drug use problems for our youth are facing in Cascade Locks. We have determined we will focus on reducing tobacco, alcohol, and prescription drugs used by our youth. And this right here, when we went to the CADCA training up in Tacoma, we went, Don and I went up for a week-long training. There's actually three weeks. We'll be going back again in May. And we had to learn how to create logic models and how it is affecting our community. And so we kind of a breakdown of what we did. We um, started out with underage drinking. And the root cause we felt was the, the lack of knowledge of negative consequences. 58% uh, perceived that alcohol use has moderate or a great risk of when used regularly, and then we also felt family management problems. And as you can see, I won't read the whole thing for you, but just to break down, <coughs> when we were looking at the data, we were quite surprised on how kids view alcohol and smoking, that it has once again started rising again, and that marijuana use has dropped down, and that the perception of harm with the tobacco and the alcohol plus the prescription drugs has been on the rise again. And this data was collected from eighth graders, 11th and 12th, uh, just this last year. One of the different things about this grant um, that's new for me that I'm really liking becoming a part of is that this grant focuses more on environmental strategies rather than programs for kids. So it's more about um, changing the way that our town works to make it a safer place for kids. So for instance, we could pay for more police we could pay, um, we can, you know, like go to the different places in town and make sure that they can't, there's nowhere to buy cigarettes, there's nowhere to buy alcohol, um, focus on where they buy drugs, those kinds of things. We will, some of the money will go towards programs with kids, but most of it is actually more about the environment. Um, we're working to build a safer and healthier community by reducing youth access to alcohol and tobacco from local realtors, from parents and homes, and from older friends or siblings. Reducing youth access to prescription drugs used to get high from parents and homes. Um, for those of you, there's a, on May 5th, we're having actually a drug take back day. Does that mean that we're extending that? I think it's a fire hall. I think it's a fire hall, we think, tentative. Um, it's a place where you, if you have old drugs, they're drugs you no longer take, you can take them and turn them in so that nobody else can. Because the old day of flushing down the toilet and putting them in the garbage isn't normal anymore. So. Um, and then increasing youth exposure to tobacco and alcohol, alcohol use in our community by increasing tobacco, alcohol, and drug-free events, celebrations, facilities, and environments. And then by increasing awareness of harm and perception of risk that alcohol, tobacco, and prescription drug use and abuse can cause to our children, families, and communities. Affirming the healthy choices that many of our youth are making in relation to drug use. That's it. That's it. Do you have any questions? Just the technical part of the grant. You said that, I think it was Don, you said that you could use the grant for extra police patrols or police funding. How does that, how is that triggered? How, how does that part of the grant work for that? And what are the requirements for the grant to have Hood River County Sheriff come in and do the drug talks or extra patrols? I can see somebody come. Okay, go ahead. She's okay. <laughs> um, part of the grant, the way that it's written is a lot of this grant involves staffing. And so it provides some, uh, some funds for funding positions. So in the case of law enforcement, it's a contractual agreement between um, with the Hood River County Sheriff's Department, this is part of the county, with the Hood River County School District because we would be doing the fiscal agent on their behalf, and it's by hours. So oh, it's, okay. it's pretty much by hours. One of the hopes is, is to increase the presence. Uh, currently, we have contracted for roughly 40 hours a week. See that increased. Uh, we'd like to see some increased presence. We'd like to see some work through schools, some presentations, um, and that sort of thing. So 
frankly, a lot of times things are discouraged by simply knowing that people are watching and that kids are very receptive to that. Thank you. So I, I remember when I, used, when I used to work at the school there, there was a program where there was a sheriff's deputy assigned to, to the schools and she came down and cast a box a couple days a week. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about or are you talking about just patrolling the town? Um, it, it could be a combination of both, Mr. Mayor. Um, what the program you're referring to is called the School Resource Officer, sure. and that particular officer, that was their job, almost a full-time position. The funding in this grant will not provide for that kind of coverage, but I'll be honest, as principal, my hope is, is that presence can come in when children realize that law enforcement are positive and, and you can develop relationships with, with children, you, you get a much different kind of reaction. So what we're asking for is a consensus or a motion or something that you guys would support us in this endeavor to get this grant. And oh, okay. Yeah, and that's and uh, we can't do motions and, and during our reports, but uh, we could do that at, a, at, an, at another meeting. But at this point, there's no reason why we can't do a consensus. Is there? Is there anyone that um, would disagree with um, the? This grant application? Yeah, sounds great. Sounds We're good. We, yeah. we have high hopes. When we went to the catfish training, one of the gals was a special speaker said she would remember us when she was reading the grants. So hopefully. <laughs> 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 well, we're so going to declare so unanimous. Uh, send her some chocolates, too. Okay, so to come back to you, I think in late May is a good news. Okay. So we need to know when you were there two months ago. You were, I was, you were there when I gave the presentation at the school. Right. On my other side, and like that, and mm -hmm. if you could brief the principal on that opportunity to do that again, my organization's always allowed me to go outside of where I work from and continue to do that work, and I think it's a very positive thing. And I've worked with the Hood River County Sheriff's Office with Joel Carm Deputy Carmody, and doing that, I think that's a great, a great tool because that opens up so many avenues to show that, that environmental design process that you guys talk about and that openness with that. So I, you have my hundred percent support because I think it's a great thing. Is the consensus enough? to get your application in? Actually, it, it's um, more of a vote of support. We do not need to have an official um, input from this group, but um, I'm sure we can work into a narrative somewhere. And uh, like I said, the application has to go in on Monday, um, electronically, and require copies. And I understand we should know within a couple of months. So yes. but thank you. We really appreciate it. It's good to know that we have your backing. There's a lot of folks working very hard from 12 different areas. And we appreciate the work that you're putting into this for the community. So thank yeah, you thanks for all the work you guys have done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good start. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we move on to our next report, um, our tourism chair had a um, quick announcement. She wasn't here to sign in uh, yes, earlier. Sorry. So. Um, I just want to let you guys know my calendar and a piece of paper, two pieces of paper on your desk. And um, those are actually provided from they can be purchased on the um, CDRA's website. And I also gave you another one of the statements in case you wanted to share those with anybody and an event calendar yet. So I want to, you know, I want everyone to kind of spread the word about CGRA. And if you have any questions on the bottom of the first page of that piece of paper, there is a, a number for those signs and you guys can contact them at any time if you have a question. Or maybe. These two is what you're talking about. Yeah, those two. Okay. Were there any questions about the statement, schedule of events, or calendar? No. Looks good. Looks very good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Okay, uh, next report we have listed is Interim Fire Chief Devin Wells. Paul, I didn't see him here. I haven't seen him either. So. Okay. So I think what we'll do is we'll save that for the end of the report. So if he does show up, uh, we'll go with that. Um, so we'll move now to our next um, presentation from City Attorney Sosowski, a report on filling vacancies. So this is agenda item 7C in your packet. And um, as, as it says in the uh, staff report, um, given that elections are coming up soon for some city council seats, I was asked to provide an opinion on the current situation and provide some clarification. 
and what I um, took this to mean was to provide some um, an opinion on the current situation with respect to the terms that the appointees have stepped into and what is going to happen or won't happen um, this November at the general at this first general election following appointment. Um, the, the first issue that I discuss in my um, memo is um, the legal standard to uphold the council's interpretation. And the reason that's important is because it is the um, city charter that addresses how appoint appointments are made for council vacancies. And the city council is the body that has the authority uh, to interpret um, the charter. Um, that can be uh, challenged in court, which is why we have a legal standard, because people have challenged city council's interpretation. Um, uh, people cha challenge legislature's interpretation of, of the statutes all the time. Um, and that standard is that, you know, in, in non-legalese, is if the interpretation makes sense given the words in the document, then the court will uphold that interpretation. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have, as is so often the case with um, laws, uh, constitutions, charters, we don't have um, the clearest language. And so um, there was an opportunity um, for an interpretation to be made whether or not you actually knew, uh, knew that you were doing it at the time. And I'll just read the provision out of the charter. Council vacancies shall be filled by a majority of the remaining members of the council. So that's the first provision that I was looking at. Council vacancies shall be filled by, by a majority vote of the remaining members of the council. The, it doesn't say that it has to be filled by a quorum of council members precisely because there may be the situation where the council is left with less than a quorum following a, a situation in which there's resignation or recall, such as you were faced here, um, leaving you with three council members. And three council members, it does not constitute a quorum to do business, but under this provision of the charter, up to one council member is all you need in order to uh, fill any vacancies that are created. The city does not have any other ordinances or council rules addressing how the vacancies are to be filled, creating any kind of a process is what I'm getting at. And so what the council did was to create the process uh, at the time that they were trying to, well, to the, what the council did was to create the process. And the three remaining councillors sat here and laid out the process, the applications would be made, and would this, um, there was a very good phrase that you used, a very open, um, open process. Transparent. Open, and, open and transparent process. And let's give credit for Paul for coming up with that language. <laughs> the open and trans, and with the help of this city administrator, uh, <coughs> the council chose that process. And the council chose not to just look at the the appointment process as being simply how, uh, how they were going to go about choosing somebody, but not how they were going to go about choosing them, how the public was going to be involved, as well as how they were going to slot those people that they chose into um, the different positions. And I feel that creating that process and going through that process is supportable under um, the city's charter. So then the next question, or the, the next uh, sentence of that provision says, the appointee's term of office shall begin immediately. That's, that's pretty, pretty clear language. It's very clear language. Once they're appointed, the term of office begins immediately. And then there's this rest of the sentence says, and shall continue until the next general election and the term for that position shall be the unexpired portion of the remaining term. So we have this phrase in here, the next general election, and then we have another phrase the term for that position shall be the unexpired portion of the remaining term. And you can read the memo and see that there's at least two plausible interpretations um, for that provision. One is the one that the council uh, chose, another one is one that I came up with. And I'm sure if we got 10 lawyers in a room, we could come up with another 20 plausible interpretations of that particular sentence and all draft very long legal briefs supporting you know, why those would be good interpretations. Um, in this particular case, the interpretation that 
that the council uh, chose was that the, the appointee stepped into the shoes of the person whose position they were filling and received the rest of that person's term. And so if there were an intervening general election like there were this November, that general election would not affect their term. So if you stepped into a position that has a term that expires beyond 2012, you are not up for election in 2012. If you stepped into a position um, for which the term expired at the end of 2012, then you are up for election um, this November of 2012. And uh, for the reasons that I state in the memo, I think that is a, a perfectly plausible interpretation. Um, it makes sense of the language used. It's consistent with um, some of the work that I understand that the Charter Review Committee had undertaken several years ago. Um, and it, it's, uh, I think it's reasonable. Um, so those were the two issues that I looked at uh, for you with respect to this. And um, that is the conclusion of my, of my report. Thank you, Alex. Other questions, comments, or discussion from the council? Well, I, I, I think I may have been one of those ones that would have said, and I, I wasn't on council then, but would have said that your term would have been until the next general election, and then that elected person takes the seat. But So that's my question, is, is my term up in November, or is it up in January 1 of 13, or whenever the... 14. Or 14, no, 13 in my case, but because I'm done. Oh, I see. I'm You're done. talking about the difference between November and January. Yeah. Do I, oh. am I out as soon as that election is certified, am I out, or do I... Oh, no. The terms run until December 31. Okay. So if you stepped into a position which, for which the term ends in 2012, you're done December 31, and then the oaths of office are usually administered at the first possible meeting in January. So technically, you actually will hold your seat until um, the oath of office is given. Okay. And that permits the council to continue to conduct business because what if we got sure. the mother of all blizzards and you couldn't meet for two months um, to fill the, to have the new appointees come in that kind of thing. Sure. It could certainly be clearer. Yes. <laughs> Other questions, comments, discussion? I had this question uh, posed to me, and I, I promised that I'd carry it forward to you. Uh, when we talk about different levels of government, you've got local here, you've got county, state, uh, each of them have their own governing documents, and our federal government has of course, the U.S. Constitution and its uh, its amendments. Um, so the question is: Does the interpre interpretation that the council's made that you're that you're explaining here violate the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution? And that's um, the duty of fair representation and uh, guarantee of a democracy. And um, my answer to that is: I don't want to make give the wrong answer. <laughs> does it is it consistent with that? Yes, it is consistent with that. Um, in my opinion. Um, we have a process for uh, elected, um, or for our officials to be elected, but we ha also have to have a process for, um, by which we can fill vacancies. And if, if the citizens choose to have a process that um, doesn't include appointments whatsoever, that change could be made to the charter. Um, but because circumstances arise, because we have the ability to recall our elected officials, we have processes in place to fill positions on, on an as-needed basis in order to be able to continue to conduct business. Citizens also have the opportunity to get rid of other elected officials who, with whom they disagree or whose appointment that they, they didn't like either. So it's, it, I believe it's all checked and balanced. So it is consistent with the Constitution. Yes. Great. Thank you. No more questions or comments. Uh, we'll move now to the next item on our agenda. Um, and uh, Paul, I believe you're going to uh, talk to us about our next vacation. Yes. Uh, 
Mayor and members of council, Kathy is going to give this report supported by the city attorney. Kathy's going to talk about our vacation. Well, actually, Mayor and council, I would like to refer to um, city attorney. Uh, she helped me a lot with this, and I know that she can better explain it and definitely answer the questions. So I get to give the whole show tonight. Um, we have received a request from a citizen um, to purchase a portion of city right-of-way. And when a, a government acquires, or at least a local government acquire, acquires right-of-way, it, it's like an easement is placed on the property. In other words, sort of the underlying title remains with the land from which the right-of-way came but this, the public has a right to use it for public purposes. And the easiest way to explain how that comes about is when you have a big chunk of land that gets subdivided and they draw all these lines all over it and then they'll put streets in and they have lot lines that go up to the street but it's understood uh, unless otherwise indicated that if the city were ever to get rid of that street, then those lot lines would each go to the center line of the street. And so th a city cannot sell a public right-of-way. It has to vacate it and return it to the abutting property owners or um, to the property from which it came. It's not always cut and dry that it would go back half and half, uh, be split in half to the abutting property owners. Sometimes you have cul-de-sacs or sometimes lots and rights of way were created under different circumstances than a subdivision. Um, but that, that's usually the way it works. So this request came in um, as a request for the city council to consider selling the property. And what I'm saying to you is that I, I don't think it would be appropriate to, to act on that request or even to consider that request in terms of, of purchase and sale um, transaction. That it is appropriate to look at that request and consider it as a vacation, a request for a street vacation. And that is governed by ORS Chapter 271. And so we can consider the uh, um, Mr. Code's request, a request for a street vacation, but I have recommended that before you take any action on that, that you wait until we have the new city planner on board, because I think it's very important that you have an opinion from a professional planner as to whether or not we even want to consider vacating public right-of-way. Today, it's difficult to acquire public right-of-way, particularly in developed areas. And so even though we might have a portion of a street that you drive by all the time that is unimproved and doesn't look like it will ever be used, perhaps the city's planning documents show that that would be a very important piece for, um, for connectivity in 20 years, um, uh, anticipating further build out. Um, so my recommendation is that you wait till there's a city planner on board and then this matter would come back before you. And then at that time the city planner would say, I don't think we even want to consider this vacation. You should deny the request and, and it would end there. Or the city planner could say, you know, it, the, we may not really need this right of way. Um, we, can, we can take further look out of it. We can take a further look at it. Let's go ahead and grant the petition and go through the public hearing process and see what the neighbors and the public have to say. Um, from there, then it would go through a, a land use process and then eventually come back to you for the final decision. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any questions, comments, I, or discussion, Randy? I, I just say I, I agree with your points on, on um, the transition, if, if that were to be the case. Um, and also we have a, a, a trails group in town that's looking at connectivity as far as walking trails through town. And, and, and if we vacated it, we could be creating an illegal dead end street that is functionally there now, but with the right of way, there could be a partial hammerhead turn or something that go, you get into the planning kind of things that I, I don't have that expertise in, but just by vacating it, we could be creating our own headache um, where it's a pre-existing thing right now. So, um, yeah, that's all I have. There may be utility <coughs> easements that we're not aware of and other things that might come into play as well. Yeah, I mean, part of the process of considering a vacation would be to see what kinds of easements are there, what kind of easements might be desirable. We can always 
retain easements and go ahead and vacate it. Um, but we, if, if we wouldn't want to retain an easement for a street and go ahead and vacate it because that really wouldn't make sense. Either we want it for a street or we don't. City planner consultant um, to, to look at this case so we can get an answer sooner to, to Mr. Cook. Did we do that with Larry? I haven't yet because we were real close to the other, so I haven't yet. Okay. And and recognizing that this is a this would be a city action. It wouldn't be something where the person who's making this request is paying a, a planning. <laughs> Correct. The city would have to pay for its own evaluation on, on the policy side of things, um, but the actual survey fees, recording fees, that kind of thing, um, we can ask that the applicant pay those and make that a condition of approval. Right, but those come subsequent to a policy decision. Yeah. Okay, other questions, comments, or discussion? Okay, are you asking for direction from council here? I guess just consensus, it, um, whether you want to proceed, um, wait till the new city planner is on board, or um, I, I guess we could proceed to obtain a, an opinion from Larry Epstein and then ask that he coordinate with the trail people and whoever else would need to be coordinated with um, regarding other what other considerations the city might have utilities and so on. So as I understand it, the options are uh, proceed or wait. Okay, and the wait would be, we go through the process of hiring the city planner and proceed would be, we, we do the best we can with uh, the city planner consultant that we have now. Okay, so just like to hear from the council members on where you stand on those. I think waiting, uh, Randy brought up a very good point about a hammerhead in the park, in the uh, trails and those issues that were there being the former city, former city planning commission, that those are huge things that we have to look at. And I think having somebody fully vested in understanding what, we, what we're looking at and going forward and using a, a new a contract plan would be a better option. Okay. Well, my understanding is that the, uh, the property owner uh, is doing some work on their property and there may be a time they might have a time issue, might be something you want to discuss with the property owner as well. Because um, may be, there may be things they're considering that are, are uh, only be an option if the property is vacated or sold, et cetera. So it might be worthwhile to have a discussion with the property owner. So does that fall into proceed or wait? Well, I guess that would... Uh, I guess that would involve pursuing it uh, to some degree, um, at least to the extent of having a discussion with the, the person who has started this ball in motion and uh, see what their, if they have a specific timeline, a specific need, or there is some pressing reason why um, that this needs to be moving forward at a certain timeline. And if so, then perhaps uh, strike an agreement that uh, um, some of the understandings that uh, Alex was talking about such as fees, etc. So I would say um, move forward uh, at least to the next step and see uh, if there's a reason that it's necessary. Okay. I'll put you down for proceed. Randy? I think, I think I would delay for the new city planner to take it up with okay. the planning commission at that point. Mark? Yeah, I'd like to see the city planner, uh, the new city planner, uh, you know, discuss and, and look at that. And also the idea of... Um, the trails. I mean, that's when Randy said that. That kind of opened up, uh, you know, new ideas. And I think uh, the uh, longer we wait, I think maybe we can come up with some, you know, some uh, different ideas. Okay. Uh, I, I proceed. XP is uh, our planner. He's the planner we've got right now, and Dan, that's what he's going to look at. You know, he'd be looking at trails. He'd be looking at all the issues we're what they are, we're talking about here. So I'm going to go in my opinion. Okay, 
So we do not have a consensus to proceed. So at this point, we will wait. Um, I think we'll we'll probably revisit this at a future council meeting. Does that answer the question? Yes. Thank All right. You. Thank you. We'll find out what his timeline is anyway. Okay. Thank you, Alex. We'll move now to our last presentation, uh, Paul's report. Honorable Mayor and members of City Council, this is the one that will keep you here till midnight. However, <laughs> if I read that, uh, you have in front of you uh, my report, uh, which has a yellow tag on it, and a public notice, City of Stevenson, City of Cascade Locks, attachment that has a pink tag on it. Uh, and so the first thing I'm going to report to you is that on March 19th at 6 p.m., there will be a joint meeting of the Cascade Lock City Council and the Stevenson City Council at Stevenson City Hall at 6 p.m. So you remember that we've been talking about trying to make this happen, and so that notice finally showed up today. It probably got stuck in the computer failures today, but that's, that's what it is. So the agenda will include... Uh, a discussion about how the two bodies can work together and then begin to identify some specific action items that can be taken. And I don't know, Mayor, if we, whether we want to check with the council at this point and see who will be there and who isn't or if they want to check in with us during the week. Uh, I, I'm fine checking in now, um, although it is, I mean, maybe some people haven't heard of it because of the emails, but uh, so it's, it's a week from today at 6 o'clock in Stevenson. And I have another meeting that night, so I won't be able to attend. Okay. I'm, I'm available to attend. Mark? I'm available. Okay. Yeah. Yes. yes it should be. Right. It, is, is there an issue with us meeting in the state of Washington? Is that? No. The, the charter requires that you hold the required meetings um, in city limits. Um, but so long as you hold one regular meeting a month, you can hold the rest of yours wherever you'd like. And, and we've also looked into the state law that governs the public meetings as well. And we, what we found right. was that uh, there is not a requirement that there's actually um, It leaves that, that possibility open. So we're sort of holding our extra meetings for walking meetings. Well, I think it's in Stevenson City Hall. Is that near Walking Man? <laughs> We're just checking. We've been walking distance. Walking it's a walking distance to Walking Man. Walking Man, five of us. <laughs> you, you don't want to do what Bell, California did and meet in Hawaii. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's other issues there. Not yeah, the I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can afford it. <laughs> Second item is the, the interview process for the planning consultants. As you'll remember, Council, you authorized us to go out for a request for qualifications for uh, planning consulting services. Your current planner uh, is going to be retire, retiring soon, and he's kind of pushing on us to get a replacement uh, so that uh, he can enjoy retirement. So we went out uh, with an RFQ. We received responses from four firms. One came in clearly after the deadline and was eliminated. Uh, the other two are planning firms. One, one is a single individual who does uh, community planning, comes from the Valley. The other firm does a statewide service. Uh, and then the third applicant was the city of Stevenson, Washington. So Kathy and I will be interviewing them um, on Wednesday of this week starting at 10 a.m. <coughs> Shortly after that time, we'll come back to council with a recommendation as to the firm that would be used. If you select Stevenson, Washington, we're going to have to pay the attorney to do an IGA, but that's how we would lash your, yourselves together with Stevenson. Uh, computers went out today. The uh, transition to the new server happened over the weekend, and apparently there were a couple bumps in the electricity. So throughout most of the day, most of us were relieved not to have many, not to receive many emails and communications. So that's just from an old person's point of view. <laughs> on, 
on, on Thursday, March 15th at 4 p.m., uh, the Port of Cascade Locks, Jill Miles, will be there. Jill is with the State Department of Economic Development. It's Oregon Biz now. Uh, and she'll be spending some time for uh, elected officials in this area talking about economic development. We're hoping that the uh, Council Subcommittee on Economic Development will be able to work that into your schedule. So I think the time would be well spent. Chuck and I have talked a little bit over the last couple of weeks, and now that the Port Commission has mirrored your activity in terms of the multifaceted approach, <clears throat> a subcommittee will be setting up a, a meeting agenda and notice and coordinating everybody's schedule so we can get the five of you together and then bring in the resource people and begin developing what are the issues you're gonna work on. We think Nestle has to be at the top of that list for sure. Uh, downtown redevelopment, uh, or revitalization, and there may be other projects that the group wants to work on. Your Public Safety Task Force has identified four different preliminary options for uh, staff to begin planning around and developing the budgets for. Those four are contract out for all services, uh, and they include chief, ambulance, fire marshal, purchasing, department administration, and the management of volunteers. The second option is continuation of the current arrangement. The current arrangement being the one where you are purchasing uh, interim fire chief services from the city of Hood River and everything else is a volunteer. Uh, third option is a full-time fire chief, paramedic, fire marshal with or including a part-time paramedic. And the fourth option there they have us looking at is a full-time paramedic with volunteers. Uh, they will meet on the 19th at 7 o'clock here, and their current schedule has them appearing before you on April 23rd with a final set of recommendations. The Downtown Revitalization Steering Committee will meet at the end of this month and will approve a draft vision statement. Their subcommittee on the uh, Downtown Cleanup will meet Friday at 11 o'clock. On number four, Paul, yes. the Public Safety Task Force. You said full-time paramedic with volunteers. Uh, what addresses the current, could that be currently using the contract fire chief or volunteer fire chief for the other operations or how does? As I understand that the thinking of the task force is that those would be four distinctly different approaches. So you may only have a, a paramedic then and that you pay for and then everybody else would be a volunteer. Okay. Mark. Paul, uh, <clears throat> you know, your last uh, statement here is, uh, should you have any questions or any of these issues or any others, um, every um, council meeting, uh, you know, is brought up on FEMA. And, you know, I, I think we need some concrete answers um, of what you know, what needs to be, what needs to happen, and I was just wondering, um, how can we do that? How can we, um, you know, get answers? Do we get it through the the um, the Hood River County? Do we get it? Um, you know, I think if we, I think we need to close this up, and I don't know, you know, how um, to go about it, but I think you know we need some, you know, concrete answers to close this, you know, chapter on FEMA. Um, do you have any suggestions or ideas? <coughs> I, I will draft a report for your review. I can tell you that in terms of uh, building the file and having the paperwork necessary to qualify for FEMA closure, we're about 30 days away from that. There are some other intergovernmental relations issues um, that I'm not quite sure how those are going to fall at the current time, and we've not been able to reach the final agreement uh, with the owner of the property uh, where the, the, the new tower has to be placed. So that's in, that's in the hands of the attorney. And as soon as we have, we have a survey that identifies where your 50 by 50 parcel is. And then that has to be registered with the county with the agreement uh, for the use of that. And you have to see the agreement before we can file that with the so those discussions have been going on, what would you say?
say, Alex, a good 45, 60 days? Well, pretty much since I started with the city, it's just been um, like pulling hen's teeth. But we're getting there. And so you'll remember, Council, that we at one point reported to you that we had to hire a surveyor to go up and identify where is the 50 by 50. What that led us to was the discovery that the current tower and the foundation for the tower uh, were outside the property that you owned. So we either had to expand the payments to the property owner or agree that we were going to stay within the 50 by 50 that you also paid for. We chose to stay within that. And then we had the electric engineer take a look at what kind of a tower could we get that would meet all the certifications and the requirements. So we're in the process of pulling all of that together, waiting for Mr. Smith to agree to the, um, the formal lease for the 50 by 50 easement and the agreement for use that goes along with that. The other issue that we're in discussions with the county and the other agencies about is the one that Don Haight mentioned, which is what does the uh, maintenance and repair uh, agreement looks like, look like? Because that, that, has, that was never done, and we're in the process of putting that together. Chief Wells is assisting us with that, so is uh, um, David Merriweather with the county. Thanks. So, and then just to add to that, I also, at, the, at our last council meeting, uh, Randy brought this up, and I believe we had a, a consensus that we'd get a monthly report from you on the status of that. Uh, you gave one at, at our last meeting, um, so it hasn't been a month yet, but I think it's, uh, because there's at least one person that's asking a lot of questions about it, that probably means there's a lot of people that have questions out there. I, I think it's a good idea that we just get regular reports uh, at council meetings so that people don't feel like they have to come in and demand answers, that they can, they can expect to have them. I and and, and I, yeah, I know that you're planning to do that at the next council meeting, but I think it's important to point that out. Follow-up question for Paul on that? Yeah. Paul, government works at a snail's pace. But when would you anticipate closure? Because uh, Mr. Hates asked for that. What process is that in place? When would you anticipate closure for the whole FEMA grant so this is done and all the information that's been requested can be handed to the citizens? I would, say I, 30, I would say 30 days. For the whole closure, for, you're talking the replacement? No, the FEMA grant, okay. we think, can be closed within 30 days. Then the next part. The tower issue, which is somewhat separate from, from the FEMA grant, may take longer discussions and negotiations. Is, which one is the holdup of the payment from the county to close the grant out? The tower. The tower, okay. So Everything. It, so the, the survey, the agreement, the, the agreement, the IGA between all of the partner agencies for how will that uh, tower be maintained, how will the radio equipment be maintained, what's the replacement schedule, what guarantees. We're, we're building that as we go. And that's, that's the countywide, yes. all, all equipment. Yeah. And Dave, as I remember, Day Wireless has the responsibility to maintain it for the first two years? We think it's five years. Five, five years. years. Five years, yes. Jeff, did you have a follow-up? Follow -up. When do you think all this will be, uh, all the questions will be answered? Timeline, three months, six months is you know, where I'm at. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but give me a day. So we I can have- 60 days at the outside. Do you think I'm too optimistic? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start negotiating 60 and 90 days here? I'm I'm just, just so, so Mr. Hayden <laughs> has an answer, then come back, hey, you said Six 60 months. days or 90 days, just so we have that, there's that, there's that benchmark that we can go, yes, I have it or no, I don't have the answer that they're looking for. So which one, what do you want to go with, 60 days? I'd say 60 days. Okay. And Tom, if, and 60 if it days. can't be, I'll come back and tell you it can't and why it can't. Okay. Because we are expecting to have regular reports until it is, until it is taken care of. Okay. Randy? La at the last meeting with the auditor here, uh, I heard him to say that he has not done an audit because it's not closed yet, and his audit will be in his next report to us, assuming he's our auditor. But 
That's what I heard. That yeah, and he, and he also indicated that certain paperwork was not readily available. We're in the process of pulling all of that up here out of the fire station and getting it organized in the recommended FEMA format. I thought he did say that he had, from the financing, he had audit, audit that, and in fact, the audit from the finance, where he had issues was on, uh, on um, all the reports, so it was still FEMA. He told us that, I thought he said he had that before. Tom's right, all the appropriation funds were all accounted for, and it was all within yeah, the guidance. Yeah. There's, there does not appear to be any wrongdoing with the funds. Documenting and building the required and recommended FEMA notebooks that has everything in one place. So if you're the auditor and you come in and it isn't here and we can't find it over there, then we have to go. With it. Okay. Other questions about FEMA? A statement? Oh, comments? Yeah, yeah I, I would just just say for for Don there. Obviously, a lot of it's obvious. <laughs> a lot of things didn't. We thought we were into this thing for twelve hundred dollars. That was it. We would buy our part of the radio. A lot of things didn't work out. And I would hope at the when this is completed, and obviously it looks to appear to be that uh, Paul's heading in the right direction, trying to work on the right things to get this thing uh, to work out for us. It's going to cost us more than twelve hundred dollars if we thought we were going to be into it. But I would just hope that the council would take a look at this thing at the end. And we look at how we do um, how we do grants, um, how we expect information to come back for us, and and um, just that whole process. The whole process will really either really collapse on that uh, on, on on the survey on that on that grant process. So anyway, it, so headed in the right direction now. It's going to cost us some money, it looks like, but it looks to me like the council needs to sit down and, and look at how we do this thing. Well, along those same lines, we talked about having a regular uh, report on the FEMA grant until for the next 60 days at least, if yes, your absolutely. prediction is true. It may be longer if Alex is this. Um, I wonder if it wouldn't be worthwhile to, um, to also include, I mean, you've done just a great job of getting us, you know, keeping us up to speed at the end of these meetings on, uh, you know, the, the planning consultant, the, the, the rate studies, the economic development, the public safety task force downtown and so on. I wonder if we couldn't just add a regular report on the budget process because we're starting to, to turn into budget sure. season and just an update on you know what's what meetings are upcoming um, and people who want to participate in those meetings. Excellent. I can have that as well as the uh, the timelines for right. the recruitment of the um, the next city administrator. Yeah, yes. Just so that, because those are both public processes and we want to make sure we keep people informed about. You know, hopefully, you know, I don't overburden you with, you know, more than two pages of that okay. report because you're shooting for midnight and I don't think you're quite getting there. I, I, got I shouldn't even and, say that. And Mayor, that's really a good point. And I'd say for the rest of council members, if there are other things that you want to, to know about, let me know. I can, I can build my report uh, any way you like. And I hope. And now. <laughs> good, good. But there's a lot of things going on, and I tried to do that midweek, end of week, and then we have this, uh, and sometimes they're the same, and sometimes they're different. But there is a lot going on, and a lot of things that you need to be kept abreast of. So, glad to do it. Okay, other questions, comments about that report? Okay, seeing so none, we'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is Barron City Council and comments. Jeff. Just that uh, a fellow council member of ours lost his wife, and I just uh, like my sympathies and condolences go out to Gail and his family for the loss of his wife. Uh, she was battling some illness, and so just uh, remember him in your thoughts and prayers, and that's obviously why he wasn't attending tonight. So. Thank you, Jeff. Brad? Um, nothing to say. Good to be back. It's good to be part of it. Randy? No, nothing tonight. Mark. 
Uh, I was disappointed that the apology letter wasn't read. I think that would have closed a chapter that would have helped heal the town. I respect the public's uh, comments, and uh, that's all I have. Sorry that Bon has to go through the things he's had to go through here with over the over the team. I hate keeps coming in and asking them the questions, and they're all they're all very appropriate questions. And uh, historically, uh, we haven't done a very good job. In the length of time we've been working with the team, we've not done a very good job of um, answering those questions. That's why those questions were all out there, and all very appropriate questions. So uh, really, council, administration, all that in here. Um, in the past year has not done a good job. I appreciate where, where Paul's head now. He's had an attic or closure of it, but, uh, but uh, it has put Don through a lot of uh, having to come in and, and keep it on top of something that should have been kept on top of for a long, for a long time ago. Uh, and uh, another thing I want to bring up is um, hopefully in, in the future we take a look at um, uh, get on agenda or something on here of uh, surplus. We've got lots of surplus stuff around and we've had some surplus stuff for years. And what's happening to us is is we we've, we've got things that um, we put in surplus or are sitting out there in, in the bone yards and that for uh, and had value. I mean they had value to them and now they're sitting there and sitting there sitting there that every day, every month, every year they, they lose they, they're losing value. The, the building behind that the car house that's go look at it. That thing is because it's given out and paid in it. It's a building like that's it's losing it's losing value. So the town's losing value on that thing. We have the uh, the big bucket truck that uh, I don't see one try to keep it. That's why we only let the fort be because it turned out that it wasn't really what the fort needed, so now it's coming back and it's just so that truck was was bought well that truck was was put out here. After the last truck, we're already, so that had to be, I'm assuming, 20, this one's 20 years old, and that one's sitting, been sitting there for, for for 20 years. So so again, we've got all kind of, we got surplus fire engines sitting out here. It's losing value. So we're, we're sitting here losing value on, on and, we, and we've got another one that's going to come up. It's going to go buy a bus <laughs> truck. And is that going to sit there? Is the one getting rid of going to sit there for 20 years before we do something about it? I, I would hope not. So, you know, general wise, I hope we take a look at, um, at surplus and start doing some, start getting a program going of how we handle surplus and, and move things out and, and don't lose the value of these things that were, you know, were surplus. That's it. Good. So, uh, just a couple of items here and uh, some updates. Um, uh, I think that the, the it's important that we all recognize that the um, Public Works Department is going through the process of uh, looking at our main water lines and trying to fix those leaks, and uh, and and we're grateful they're doing that work. It's 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 definitely needed. What it may lead to is as people as, as the the lines tighten up, the water pressure may be greater at people's meters, and it may impact. Um, the, the section of the pipe that goes from the meter to your house, which could potentially cause um, leaks that are re the responsibility of, of property owners. So when that, when and if those kind of types of things do happen, I think it's important that we recognize the city does have a policy. There's a new uh, document explaining that policy um, that the Public Works has prepared, um, and it, it, it's, it requires the property owner to coordinate with the Public Works staff. Um, and so that we can have uh, better, better communication about this. I believe that the, the staff are planning to send that out to all uh, utility payers uh, on an upcoming bill, but it will be provided um, should those unfortunate kind of type of things happen. And one of the ways that I think people find out about it is they look at their, their water bill and it's doubled or quadrupled and oh, look at that, I haven't, I haven't been taking that many showers. And, um, and, and so then you have to start investigating. It's important that we do coordinate with the city staff. So I, I, that's, that's a change that I, I think is important that, that the uh, Public Works Department has made and, and, uh, and it's important that we all um, you know, coordinate uh, if those, those things do happen. Uh, I've also had uh, 
meeting with the chair of the tourism committee just to talk about uh, you know our vision for downtown revitalization and uh, the role that tourism has to play in that. Um, it was a good, healthy discussion, and um, um, I really do see a lot of positive things happening for our, for our town with tourism as well as other um, other efforts in downtown revitalization. Uh, there there are uh, four open positions on the tourism committee now, and, and those have been advertised and, and available. We're, we are planning to make appointments at our next council meeting, and uh, the applications can, for those positions uh, are on the city website as well as uh, you can come to directly to City Hall to get those. Um, I just want to uh, commend the, the downtown revitalization group, in particular um, the, the crew that's planning the well, what did you call it? The, the, the greatest? Well, Gary said we have to call it the most effective cleanup campaign in the Western Hemisphere. Western Hemisphere. <laughs> okay, so, so it's the most effective in the Western Hemisphere, and it, it really is it's over the course of a couple of different months, starting on April Fool's Day, which I thought was a particularly good choice. That was Gary's choice. Yeah. Too. Uh, <laughs> And it, it, it's not the, it's not just planning. They're not just talking. They're, they've actually already been out and doing some cleanup work. Um, and Tom mentioned the Bell Dental Fire Station. There's there's a, been a, a shed that's been removed uh, by that group. Um, these are these are positive steps in the right direction. And and I just want to commend that group because it's um, uh, the goals that they've set are 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 going to be great for our community. Um, when when we look back on this, they, you know, that was probably the first step in a in a, a long series uh, that's going to bring uh, you know this this vital vital energy to our downtown, and, and I, I hope that uh, more and more people will start to attend those meetings and, and lend a hand, uh, particularly as we move into cleanup season. But there's there's going to be other uh, uh, other items that, that, that they recognize as, as goals. Uh, at their Paul mentioned the March 29th meeting, they'll be talking about the vision statement for the town. And, I think that encompasses a lot of different projects that can be undertaken. If you're, if you're not into painting, you know, maybe you're into you know, recruiting businesses or, or things like that that, uh, that, that that can bring value to our town. So um, I want to wholeheartedly support the work that they're doing. Um, and, and I know it's, it's for the benefit of the community and we appreciate it. Um, last item I had to talk about, um, didn't make it to the, the, the regular list, but uh, I am getting regular updates on the work uh, to restore the historic Columbia River Highway. Um, anyone that's been driving uh, in the direction of Portland recently has seen that they are, uh, they're busy uh, restoring, I believe they're calling it the Lost Mile uh, section that's going to connect Troutdale to, uh, to Cascade Locks. Um, there's also uh, an advisory committee meeting on March 16th, uh, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Port of Hood River Conference Room. Uh, just to, to, uh, to give updates and to talk about uh, a couple of different projects they're working on in the, the historic highway. Uh, this is a great project. Uh, I, the latest I heard was we're anticipating this is going to be completed uh, you know, sometime in the summer, maybe even early fall. Um, it's uh, a lot of people are looking forward to, to having, that, um, having that section of highway restored. When you see what they're doing, it's, I mean, just <laughs> uh, the, the picture that's on their website is you've got a a backhoe on the top of a ledge. I mean, I drove by that a couple times. How did they get that thing up there? But you know, people are going to be riding their bikes and walking by there. Uh, that's part of the old highway, and um, I think it's great that ODOT is, is doing something positive um, to you know to bring people to our community. Um, and uh, you know, anyone that can, I encourage you to to, to check out the website this, uh, uh, that that talks about the, the work that they're doing. So. Uh, that, that missing mile is going to be restored, but we'll be connected soon uh, next year. And that's all I have. So we'll turn now to uh, other matters. Anyone have other matters they'd like to discuss? Okay. We do not have an executive session planned for tonight, so the last item on our agenda is adjournment. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, a motion has been made by Jeff Alfred, second by Randy Holmstrom. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We're adjourned. Thank you, Council. Thank you. So, I like that class.